public instead. Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? The women with the least likelihood of getting pregnant are the ones most worried about having abortions. On January 6th of 2021, you had tens of thousands of people peacefully protesting. So, it's not a right-wing conspiracy theory. It's not QAnon. It's real. <laughs> Our guest today on the enemies list is Pete Wainer. He is a guy who has shaped a lot of words in his life and a lot of things and ideas that you've seen American presidents say and a lot of the, the the rhetoric and the and the difference in the republican party today is very stark because of the way uh, pete learned and, and and helped communicate going back uh, in the reagan uh bush 41 and george w administrations and in writings from the washington post to the atlantic and everywhere else um we come from i think Pete, a, a, a place in an older party where there was a kindness to it and a, and a kind of um, a kind of not to use the old kinder, gentler phrase, but it was a kinder, gentler party when we were coming up as younger guys. And, and I'm curious, you wrote a piece last week called The Party of Malice, and it really that that title really struck me and that that concept really struck me about just how define today's Republican Party is just by cruelty and nastiness. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Thanks for having me on, Rick. I appreciate it a lot. Um, first, in terms of what you were talking about, the party that you and I emerged from, I mean, it wasn't a perfect party, and there were probably mm-hmm. lesser genes that I, I wasn't aware of as I sure. should have been. Nonetheless, it was a profoundly different party. I think it was a profoundly different party philosophically. For one thing, I'd say now the Republican Party is not a conservative party, but a populist nationalist Mm -hmm. party. Um, But I think the biggest change is what you're getting to, which are the sentiments, the disposition, the sensibilities. And uh, for George W. Bush, he he had a phrase which he was championing called compassionate conservatism. Mm -hmm. It was interesting that never actually really had a lot of resonance with the base of the party. Even when he was president, there Mm -hmm. there was resistance to it. And that was at a time in which you could begin to see where the Republican Party was was going. Um, but even before that, and in a different arena, I guess, or different domain, the, there were figures of a kind of grace. Ronald Reagan was a man of of of, of grace and a certain dignity. You, you know, mm-hmm. the old stories, he wouldn't take his coat off in the Oval right. Office. And well, Reagan was the uh, object of some pretty nasty attacks he almost never responded in 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 kind george h w bush was a man of just renown of like just a sterling character the, beloved by thousands of people fr- friends and so forth and george w bush whom i knew best because i worked closest with him was a person both of deep is a person of both deep christian faith and also a man of integrity and decency. And that matters because these movements, these sentiments within both parties can exist that are somewhat malicious. Then the, the question becomes political leadership, which is mm-hmm. what do the leaders do to contain it, control it, put it on the fringes? And of course, when Donald Trump came along, he tapped into those things which were pre-existing and then he he, he amplified it. But yeah, I, I broke with the Republican Party relatively early in the Trump yeah. years, and it was part of uh, part of the reason is what you alluded to, which is a kind of malice, a t- kind of cruelty and crudity um, that was really at odds with the party that that um, I was a part of and that I would want to be a part of. It it always struck me, and, and you know you you looked at the at the Republican presidents of our lifetime, the things that shaped us. Because you and I, like I said, you and I are about the same. I was a young guy in the first Bush administration. You know, I was 24 years old when I came in. It was, I was young. I, it was, it was new. But, you know, as we were coming up, you know, we went through Reagan and then Bush 41 and then W. And, and people can disagree with them ideologically or politically. But they, the character of those men always seemed to reflect the conservative movement and the party in varying degrees and capacities. But now it seems like the only thing that the party does is it, the party now and the, and the, and Republicans now reflect the character of Trump yeah. back 
it, it seems like that weird inversion was that, do you think that was inevitable that we were going to get to something like that is that just a societal thing or is it just something that else that broke yeah it's a it's a really good question i don't think it was inevitable um but uh but i think there were currents that were that were happening um that uh that, that made this a possibility. And then Trump, Trump seized, seized onto it. You know, I mean, Donald Trump, because he's a person of no r- r- real uh, political leanings, he right. was liberal in many ways, as, as you know, uh, before sure. he joined the Republican party and he was flirting with an independent bid in the late nineties. Um, and uh, you know, if he, if he had decided to, to become a Democrat or let's say he would have run for the Republican nomination in 2012 or 2008, mm-hmm. And lost, uh, that might have finished him politically, and somebody else would have gotten the nomination, and the Republican Party would have gone in a different direction. It it may have reflected. In fact, I'm pretty confident it would have reflected some of these changes, some of these uh, undercurrents that were happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the party would have changed. But I think what when Trump came in and first won the nomination, and certainly when he won the presidency. That transformation of the party was was complete. Um, you know, I would argue that Trump's imprint on the Republican Party exceeds even that of Ronald Reagan, and mm-hmm. that's saying a lot for people like you and I because we for sure. knew uh, not only the impact of Reagan during his two terms, but in the aftermath. I mean, he yeah. basically set the parameters uh, of of the GOP for you know for decades afterward. Um, but Trump took that in. There, there's been a moral inversion of the party. They chose not only a person who is corrupt, but a man of borderless corruptions, mm-hmm. a man of sociopathic tendencies, um, and a person that, as best I can tell, um, will do anything or say anything. I don't think there's any line that Donald Trump won't cross no, I... um, to advance his own interests. Um, I, I want to say one. One thing about that, too, in some respects, one can be somewhat more, I'm not sure if understanding is the right word. I, I do think that Trump is sociopathic. Sure. I don't think that he has a moral core. I think for him, morality uh, is to Trump what color is to a person who's colorblind. I just don't think he has it. I don't think he sees it. So what he does is perfectly predictable. Oh, yeah. To me, the 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 more disappointing thing, and in some ways the stronger indictment, is the party that has rallied around him, the people who know better and yet have gone along with with this moral freak show. Um, and it's it's not anything that uh, that I would have imagined happened when uh, when 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 I started my journey in the in the Reagan administration. Sure, I mean, uh, we look at I, I was this morning for some reason I was thinking about. An event that I, just before I worked for the Bush campaign in 88, I was working for Connie Mack. I was political guy for Connie Mack. And I remember this moment of Connie Mack and Jack Kemp at this, at this dinner. And I was just, I was a kid. I was five minutes out of college. I was watching these two guys just have this wonderful, like optimistic thing. Like, you know, if we start building out this ability for everybody to engage in the, Amer- and I, I look back at that now and I just can't even imagine, it would be like people speaking Sumerian, <laughs> ancient Sumerian to a Republican voter. Now they, they, and they were having like a round table at some event and people just, people were, just, their hearts were full. And now I don't think you, I don't think the language even exists for, for what the MAGA party is now. Yeah, that's a, that's a very telling anecdote. I, I worked with Jack uh, for years at mm-hmm. we were a place called Empower America, and um, and you know Jack, it's interesting that you ma- mentioned him. I, there may be no more antithetical figure to Jack Kemp than Donald Trump, mm-hmm. uh, for the reasons that you said. <laughs> Jack was so capacious in his views. Um, I don't think Jack ever met a person in politics he didn't like. Uh, right. It, you know, it's, to some extent, as you'll recall, some people were frustrated with him when he was a vice president for Dole because he wouldn't go after Clinton and right. and Gore in the debate, you know, hard enough. It just wasn't in Jack to do that. And for him, uh, you know, the, the, it, it was all sunshine and 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 broad and bright horizons and all possibility, um, maybe too much so in Jack's case. But it spoke of a certain 
um, heart and cast of mind, uh, which one couldn't help but appreciate. And of course, as, as, as you know, as well as I, he was always trying to reach out to broaden the party. Absolutely. Uh, to bring in uh, uh, on matters of race, but on other things too. So it's, you're right. It, it's, it would be like a different language. And if, if a Republican leading Republican used the language of Reagan or, or, or Kemp uh, or, or, or Bush's, you know, they would, they would be laughed at and, sure. and it, they would be viewed as, as, as rhinos and as, woke and you know with snowflakes and 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 all the rest so it's it's difficult to overstate how much the party has changed in terms of those dispositions it really it really has and i think it, i think in few ways other than on immigration you could you see a wider a wider difference i mean they they all you know reagan and both bushes and and they believed in the propositional nature of america it wasn't blood and soil it was right. did you come here to build a life and did you build a life in this country based on the rules of america did you follow the constitution did you become a part of the culture and the society and that is that that propositional nature i always thought was the center of the american brand to use it you know in the, in the modern parlance and now it's just disappeared it's like the, the 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 desire to close the door um and the and the the racial component of anti-immigration views used to be kept way under the radar screen, and now it seems to be front and center with white replacement and all that. That doesn't, it, it, I mean, at least to me, that seems to be like the most painful, like departure from that idea you could have an America and and even conservative America that was that comprised of people from everywhere. Yeah, that's 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 good insight. Uh, in terms of public policy, I, I would agree with you. I think immigration has been the biggest, the biggest change. As you said, it 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 was a propositional party, not a blood and soil conservatism, yeah. and now it, it it is very much that. And um, and it's not just a, you know a a reluctance to to to, to bring immigrants in. I mean, that's a, that's a legitimate debate that society. Oh, sure. Which 100%. is certain levels of immigration that you know you you have to cap it at some point. So, honorable, thoughtful people would disagree with that. This is something very different. This is the targeting uh, of immigrants, turning them into the other, the subhuman nature. Now, Trump, you know, signaled that right from the get go when he was going down the golden escalator in 2016, mm -hmm. and he was describing in this case, you know, uh, illegal immigrants, but that it was a dehumanization, and 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 it struck me. I wonder if, if you think the same thing in the 2016 uh, campaign um, attacking immigrants was to Trump. What welfare reform was to Clinton. Every time right. a guy in a jam, that's the card he played, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it was the Muslim ban or, or, or any of the, uh, any of the, the, uh, the other stuff. The other thing is uh, I have looked at um, a uh, Houston, uh, it's on YouTube, you can watch debate mm -hmm. between George H.W. Bush, Ronald Reagan, 1980, Republican primary in Houston. And there's okay. a four or five minute conversation, it's a question that was asked of them about mm -hmm. uh, undocumented workers, illegal immigrants. And Bush and Reagan are almost falling over each other to show generosity toward them. And of course, Ronald Reagan signed an amnesty bill in 1986 for more than 3 million you know, illegal immigrants. Um, and you read Reagan's speeches and both Bush's speeches on immigration. And you know th the way in which they viewed immigrants as, as great contributors to the country um, is very, very powerful. And I think for really sure. does go to the best of America and really to the roots of America. Uh, so I think that that, uh, that about face on immigration, it's one issue, but maybe it's the most, uh, most obvious. Yeah. I think that, I think that's one of the real painful ones. So I'm, I, I think a lot about the sort of like 30,000 foot view and we've talked about it in this conversation, the sort of sense of, uh, uh that the party today, the Republican party today is defined by this sort of pessimism and malice and closed endedness. Um, and I think it does infect the whole country. I think there's there's always a, a sort of like, I think pessimism is really contagious. Right. How does a country survive without a big optimistic narrative? Because I, I feel like that was always another part of America. And you, you've you captured that I, in a lot of your writings 
and the speech writing you did, uh, that that sense of this this big hopeful country, and and it just seems like the darkness on on frankly on both sides. There's an apocalyptic darkness on the left as well. Uh, how does a country survive without a without a a hopeful narrative for its future? Yeah, I think over time it probably doesn't. I mean, it it can withstand it for some period of time. Um, but in the end, you, you can't, as a as a nation, have large parts of the population wed to catastrophism and hate and grievance. I mean, it's it's a pretty toxic stew. So as you said, it's a dark vision. It's in many ways a despairing vision. Um, and, but it's more than that. It's it's also this 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 hatred and this antipathy for for others. I think they're tied in, by the way, because. Mm-hmm. I think, the, the people who have a catastrophic view of where we are, if they think that the country is at the edge of a cliff, that, you know, we're two minutes from midnight and that the other side is not just an opponent, but an enemy and that they want to hurt the country, your children and you. If, right. if that's your, 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 your attitude, your outlook, then that'll push you into some pretty desperate places and some pretty dark places. And then you develop a hatred for other people. And that, of course, catalyzes its own series of complications, which is, will you compromise? Like our system of government is set up uh, because of the separation of powers and all the rest for compromise. But if you believe this is the children of light against the children of darkness, you, you can't do that. So over time, um, a country has to come together to some degree um, or it splits, splits apart. And part of that is, is a hopeful vision. You know, as, as you know, because of your work in politics, you, you've always got to be attuned to the moment, right? Sure. So I, my hunch is that, a, that, you know, a Reagan kind of optimism wouldn't work in this, in this uh, moment. It's, it's a different, right. different moment. Do you have to be able to speak? to that moment that resonates with people, but then you have to try and kind of find an inflection point and you have to root the vision of the country into something higher and better and more beautiful and more hopeful. Um, And it can't be Pollyannish um, and, but it has to resonate and, and maybe they're themes of honor and decency. Um, Mm -hmm. I do think also just to, to to add to, to your point, um, I wonder if you're finding this anecdotally. Um, there is, you know, America's capacity for self renewal is pretty remarkable, and there are these um, gr- uh, studies that have been done about the exhausted majority. Uh, you know, the yes. people are just mm-hmm. tired of this relentless a- antipathy and acrimony, and you see groups and individuals and movements that are beginning to arise. Um, I, I just talked to somebody this morning, actually, I ran into him at, at Starbucks and he had been to three different cities. He's involved in the sort of political, cultural, social arena. Mm-hmm. He said, you know what topic came up more than it, any other at those three different stops? And I thought, I, I thought, well, is it Taylor Swift or something? <laughs> and, and he said, love. He said, people were just talking about love and the need for love. So I do think that sometimes a virus creates its own antibodies. And I think sure. we're sort of in the midst of this struggle right now, which is people seeing the direction that the extremes, but particularly Trump, has taken the party and saying, this isn't what this country is about. It's not what we want to be about. And they want to shake this cloud uh, that is that is hovering over them. Uh, on the other hand, we're against forces that are very, very determined and very, and, in their own way, very skillful. So mm-hmm. I feel like this is a kind of a great drama playing out, and we really don't know how it's going to. Uh, we don't know what the denouement is going to be. Uh, I think that's right. I, I don't think we have a. I, I don't think. And, and the the good the good side of it is, I don't think the the, the that the Trump side, the nationalist side, populist side, however you want to describe it, I don't think they have an end game really either. I think the apocalyptic vision of, uh, you know, we have to do it right now. We have to take everything we can do right now. It does not really have, you know, it's like most end time cults have traditionally been wrong yeah. about the end times. Right. Yeah, I agree. There's not really an agenda even that they're after. I think right now it's a very limbic system generated. Mm-hmm. And and a lot of it, um, you know, there's this term that's that's used, which I think is 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 opposite the, the moment we're in, which is affective polarization, which yes. means that 
the polarization is driven more by hatred for the other side than loyalty and love of your own side. I think that's very much the case in the American right. And, and mm-hmm. um, I mean, Donald Trump could, you know, could spin the wheel and he could one day or one week end up in one place on a particular issue uh, and end up a week or two later in a different place. And they would follow him. That's the nature of a kind of cult of personality, which we're, which we're facing. But I, from the right, certainly from the MAGA world, uh, what matters is owning the libs. It's whatever they want. We're, you know, we're against. Right. And that, um, that's potent potentially, but you can't build a country or a vision uh, on it because they don't really know from what I can tell what they really want. They don't even, they're not even interested in governing. This is, no. this oh, is all QED show. everything with yeah. the Hill right now, right. from Ukraine to the border, everything else. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I think this is theatrics. It's a particularly ugly and dangerous right. kind of theatrics, but it is a theatrics and um, you can't, run a government through theatrics right through 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 theater so one last question for you what as a as a guy who's been a white house speechwriter um what do you think of biden's rhetorical presentation his speeches his 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 big public communication style i happen to like it um but i'm curious what your take on it is yeah i think he i think he does pretty well I, i think in his major speeches they're pretty thoughtful um I think he understood the theory of the case in 2020, which was the soul of the country. Mm -hmm. And I thought he made that case reasonably well. Um, I I think they've been a little bit scattered so far um, up until now. And I I really think now that, you know, the the GOP primary is de facto over. They've really got to get 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 their rhetoric and their campaign in 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 order. Um, But I find. Uh, his rhetoric pretty good not 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 historic not hugely right. moving and i do think that part of the problem is his presentation um he's he's never been a great orator no. i think he, when he was younger he viewed himself i think he patterned himself after bobby kennedy i think mm-hmm. that was probably the 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 f- political figure that, that he he most admired right um but certainly since he's gotten older, it's just harder for him to carry to carry that message. You know, um, I've, I've had discussions with people uh, who, who are not pro-Trump, but are conservative and, mm-hmm. and they're critical of Biden. I'm much less critical of Biden. A, I think he's actually a bulwark against the radical left on a Absolutely. whole range of, of, of issues. I, I don't think there's anybody who could be realistically the leader of the Democratic Party now who would be better than than Biden in that, in oh, that respect. Absolutely. The other thing I give him quite high marks on is he has ignored a lot of provocations from Trump and MAGA. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, I don't think he has gone intentionally to divide the country. I think he has, he has tried as best he can to unite it in, in some ways, but there are limitations for him as an individual, but I also think there are just limitations in terms of where the country, uh, sure. country is. I do think that at the end of the day, uh, he's, going to have to prosecute the case against Trump in a powerful way. He shouldn't cross any lines. He shouldn't, you know, go down in the gutter, but he's got to make the case that Trump is a fundamental threat to, uh, to democracy and to human decency and that America is better than, than, uh, than this. There are other things he's going to have to do. You'd know better than I, because you've, you've been more intimately involved in campaigns than, than, than I have. Um, but, but rhetoric is, a, is, is a lot and, and everybody knows rhetoric is important from music lyrics to, mm-hmm. to letters from loved ones, to books that, that mean something, some about words that resonate in the human heart and the human spirit sure. and catalyze action. And, um, and he's going to need to find that, but, but, uh, but I think he's, he's done a, done a pretty good job. Well, Pete, where can people find your writings and where can they find you on social media? Uh, in terms of writings, uh, the Atlantic and the New York Times uh, uh, are the are the places uh, to uh, uh, to go. That's the main places that uh, that that I uh, that I write for. And um, I'm I'm on uh, Twitter or X and uh, and I'm a senior fellow at the Trinity Forum. 
Terrific, terrific. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Pete Weiner. You have been a spectacular guest. I love this conversation, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for having me on and, and for what you're doing. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right. Look, folks, like many of you, I use a lot of Apple products, iPhone, Macintosh, blah, blah, blah. My earbuds are, uh, I'm on like, my phone says, like Rick's earbuds, pair eight. So I, I, I use a lot of Apple products. But I swear to you, if I see you wearing the goddamn Apple Vision Pro headset in public, I'm going to slap it off your face. Oh my God, people. Scott <laughs> Scott Galloway makes the point that Apple products are tend, tend to be used by people who are in the, the top billion in the world. There is nothing about this goddamn headset that makes you look cool or smart or or interesting. It makes you look like a goddamn idiot. Do not wear the Apple Vision Pro headset in public. Do not walk on the street wearing it. Please, for the love of Jesus, do not drive your car wearing it. I, 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 I know this isn't like the normal enemies list person or thing that you guys are used to hearing, but there's something about me that that, that 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 headset has triggered the inner Luddite in me in some profound way. Don't wear the fucking Vision Pro headset in public. If you want to wear it at home, wear it at home. If you want to wear it in your office, wear it in your office. But if I catch you driving with that goddamn thing, I, I'm going to lose my mind. Anyway, that is my item today on the enemies list. I know it's not a standard thing, but you're just going to have to let me have my my 60-year-old Luddite moment with the Apple Vision Pro headset. <laughs>